Hi, everybody. Good evening, and welcome to the Washington County Museum of Fine Arts. My name is Jillian McMaster, Manager of Publications and Media, and I'm happy to welcome you to Let's Talk Art. Tonight, we have Museum Director Sarah Hall and Agnita M. Stein Schreiber Curator Daniel Folco in discussion with special guests Elizabeth Howe, Librarian and Certified Archivist from the Western Maryland Reading Room at the Washington County Free Library, Carol Miller Schultz of the Washington County Gene Genealogical Society, and Brett Peters, Curator of the Washington County Historical Society. They will dive deep into the genealogical history of the painted subjects in the exhibition, Joshua Johnson, Portraitist of Early American Baltimore, on view at the museum through January 23rd, 2022. As always, please feel free to ask any questions you may have in the chat area or use the Q&A function on Zoom. Welcome everybody. Thanks for joining us this evening for our special edition of Let's Talk Art. Um, tonight, we're focusing on some of the works in Joshua Johnson, Portraitist of Early American Baltimore, a fascinating exhibition that publicly brings together a substantial group of Johnson's paintings for the first time since 1988 please do visit the exhibition if you haven't. And um, I would say uh, recommend that if you're interested, you can check out some of our other programming related to the exhibition on our YouTube channel, which includes a full length lecture by uh, Dr. Daniel Fulco, our Agnita M. Stein Schreiber curator, as well as a Let's Talk Art we did back in the spring with the exhibition catalog authors called New Perspectives on Joshua Johnson. Uh, before we get started, I want to acknowledge the financial support we received for this important exhibition. Joshua Johnson, Portraitist of Early American Baltimore, was generously supported by grants from the National Endowment for the Arts, the Art Dealers Association of America Foundation, an anonymous donor, Mr. and Mrs. James N. Holzapfel, Dr. and Mrs. George E. Manger, the Heart of the Civil War Heritage Area, Maryland Marketing Partnership, Community Foundation of Washington County, Maryland, Dr. and Mrs. Robert S. Strauch, and Mr. and Mrs. Thomas B. Ryford. And now I'll just give you a little more information on tonight's guests for Let's Talk Art. Um, tonight, Daniel and I are joined by Elizabeth Howe, who has worked as a reference librarian and archivist in the Western Maryland Room at Washington County Free Library for over 15 years. She's served as the Maryland Library Association archivist for 10 years. Uh, she enjoys caring for and preserving primary sources such as books, photographs, letters, newspapers, and maps. Um, you can see she is um, perfectly situated to show us what her work life is like um, tonight, um, as well as uh, archival records of local organizations. Um, she also loves to assist researchers in their pursuit of historical resources. Also with us tonight is Carol Miller Schultz, a retired special education teacher from the Washington County Public Schools and the immediate past president of the board of directors of the Washington County Historical Society. Carol is one of the founders of Kinship Family Heritage Research Center, a dedicated genealogy center at the Miller House, which is in Hagerstown, Maryland. And I realize that not everyone on these Zoom um, or Facebook streamed events is necessarily from our local environs. So um, that is part of the uh, Washington County, or is part of the his History Center, the Miller House here. She also teaches genealogy courses through continuing education at Hagerstown Community College. Um, and she thought that she would spend her retirement researching her personal genealogy, but it actually turned into a new sort of vocation in which she is a teacher and a resource for others wanting to get started with their genealogy. And you will um, be uh, the benefit, the beneficiary of her knowledge tonight. And also with us tonight is Brett Peters, the curator of the Washington County Historical Society. Uh, born and raised in South Brunswick, New Jersey, Brett grew up 10 minutes from Princeton Battlefield and became fascinated with history at a young age. Today, he oversees exhibition development and collections at the Miller House Museum and assists with museum programming, event development, print, social media, and marketing. He has a Bachelor of Arts in History from the College of New Jersey and a Master of Science in Museum Leadership from Drexel University. If for, I'm going to pretty much disappear after this um, introduction, and I may chime in some comments or questions. Um, I am not a main speaker or presenter tonight, but if you are interested in knowing more about me or Daniel, um, you can go to our YouTube channel and see the very first Let's Talk Art we did nearly a year ago in which we introduce ourselves and talk about our backgrounds. 
Um, so that's there um, for anyone interested. Now that the introductions are complete, I'm going to hand off to Daniel, who will set the context for our conversation tonight. And I'll see everybody again at the end of the program. I think this is going to be really fun. Thank you, Sarah. And it's my great pleasure tonight, before I hand things over to our guest speakers, to just acquaint you a bit with Joshua Johnson, especially for those of you who may not know about his work. Um, I'm just going to give you a brief overview of his biography and also his uh, creative production. So Joshua Johnson is an artist who is born outside of Baltimore City around the year 1763. Before I continue, these are the paintings tonight that you're going to see in another presentation that we're looking at. And I just want to show these to you. So this is the focus of tonight's discussion. But he was born as the son of a white slave owner and a black mother. So he is biracial. And Joshua Johnson begins his life very likely as a blacksmith and may at that time have gained some rudimentary artistic training in terms of how to prepare canvases and how to create portraits. Some have also argued in his early years in the 1770s and 80s, once he made his way to Baltimore town as it was called back then in the late 18th century, he may have been a sign or carriage painter or maybe even been involved with the uh, creation of furniture and the painting of it. And all this information the reason why we're able to tell you about him tonight, at least have a sense of his life and where he went uh, in his career is because of these documents right here in terms of tonight's focus about history. Joshua Johnson's record of sale and deed of manumission was uncovered in the mid 1990s and it was added to the collection of the Maryland Center for History and Culture. And I should mention that the exhibition that's on view at the museum draws heavily upon the collections from Maryland Center for History and Culture, formerly Maryland Historical Society Museum, and they have the largest collection of Joshua Johnson paintings anywhere. So there are nine Joshua Johnson paintings included in the exhibition can, that are drawn from their holdings and that have been there for quite some time, some acquired more recently. But the documents here spell out his name, which is spelled alternatively within the documents themselves, telling us who his original slave owner was. It says here, the son of a George Johnson, and also it calls him at that time, that was the terminology, mulatto, referring to his mixed race, Joshua. So he's actually spelled out on these documents, but originally owned by a Baltimore slave owner who lived north of the city named William Wheeler. These were amazing finds, these documents, because prior to 1995, we could only speculate by knowing this artist's name within Baltimore City directories as to his racial identity. Once these were uncovered, we were able to confirm that we are talking about this biracial, and in this case, African-American artist of enormous significance. He begins to advertise himself in the late 1790s with this advertisement here on the left in which he calls himself a self-taught genius. And that refers to his tremendous confidence at a time in the early American Republic, when African-Americans are looking at the paradoxes of American society, and particularly the uh, fact that they are being called or referred to in uh, American founding documents, the Constitution, Declaration of Independence, as being equal, but that is not entirely the case. However, for Joshua Johnson, he perseveres, and as it mentions here in the advertisement, he had to overcome a number of challenges or hurdles in order to become an artist in Baltimore and in Maryland, which was a slave owning state. He'll then advertise himself again in 1802. And that was the last advertisement that we are, have been able to find. He moved quite a bit around the city, originally living near Hanover Street and then moving over to what would be today North Gay Street. So Joshua Johnson's world go down here to what would be the inner harbor of the city today. At that time, the ships would pull right up there. And he moved around these neighborhoods. There are Pratt Street up to Baltimore Street, and then eventually over here to what's today Fells Point, and a little bit further east until towards the end of his life, he makes his way up towards the newly expanding and fashionable Mount Vernon. So Joshua Johnson paints his neighbors here primarily, members of the upper 
middle class of merchants, small business owners, and also some civic officials. Paintings in the exhibition include the very famous James McCormick family, a large group portrait, which is really outstanding from early in his career. I should mention that Joshua Johnson, we believe died sometime between 1824-25 and 1830, because that's the last time he's mentioned in the Baltimore City directories. He's particularly adept at painting children and particularly their relationships to their parents. He also painted kids uh, on their own. And as you're gonna see tonight in the discussion, we have two very important portraits that talk about family issues as well as gender issues at the time. He also painted prominent African-Americans, such as the Coker brothers, two Methodist ministers who lived in the city of Baltimore. On the left, Abner Coker, you can see this painting in the exhibition. It's very well done. And it shows Abner in a very dignified pose, gazing out at the viewer from this oval frame. On the right-hand side is another portrait that's in the United Kingdom of Daniel Coker, his brother, also a Methodist minister. And tonight, will be discussed is the Washington County Museum of Fine Arts portrait pair, Benjamin Franklin Yo Sr. and son Benjamin, as well as portrait of Susanna Amos Yo and Mary Elizabeth Yo. So father and son, mother and daughter, two Washington County residents. These are two direct copies uh, or alternate versions that are made of the paintings in Washington County Museum of Fine Arts. And this will also be addressed tonight as well as Greenberry Wilson by Joshua Johnson, a later work from probably about 1820, and then a painting in the collection of the Washington County Historical Society of Dr. Edward Butler. So with that introduction, I am going to hand it over to uh, Carol Miller Schultz, and she's going to tell you some more about these various subjects painted by Joshua Johnson. Actually, Elizabeth is going to go first, and then I will uh, go after her. Thanks. So I'm Carol Miller Schultz, and I feel privileged to be asked to research and present our findings on the lives of several of Joshua Johnson's sitters who have a connection to Washington County, Maryland. I'm going to give a brief explanation of our process and then Carol will share the presentation she created with the details of what we found. And as Sarah said, if you haven't visited the Joshua Johnson exhibit at the museum yet, please do. Viewing the actual paintings, which are beautifully curated is the best way to see them. I, I ran over there just the other day because I hadn't been there and it's, it's really a lovely, um, exhibit. During our process, we found information about the sitters, of course. Um, we always hoped for more, and there were definitely times when we were disappointed, like we would look somewhere and be very hopeful, and it just wasn't there, which, you know, happens often. But we also gained a clearer picture of life in Washington County during the late 18th and early 19th centuries. We discovered more about our own local collections of historical materials, and we shared our various, and, and we learned more about each other as we shared our various areas of expertise. The art of the genealogist and family historian is the art of discovering past connections and piecing a story together. Genealogists and family historians also cultivate current connections with people and resources in order to discover these past con connections. The material that Carol and I are presenting this evening represents a network of individuals and repositories that we consulted in addition to searching so much information that can be accessed online, of course. Here are a couple examples of some um, resources that we used. Individuals first, while exploring the location of a significant mill near Sharpsburg, we found out that descendants of the family we were researching had recently visited Washington County and left their contact information. So we wrote to them in Texas, they lived in Texas, and we received a kind and helpful reply. 
Another example, since the sitters lived in Baltimore at various times, we contacted the Maryland Department at Enoch Pratt Free Library. And the manager there was able to help us locate a death notice that we hadn't been able to find another way. We use books and family files, tax records and newspapers from our own local repositories, the Washington County Historical Society and the Western Maryland Room at Washington County Free Library. And we always tried to go back as much as we could to the original um, primary source. You know, if, if someone mentioned something and we weren't sure about it, we would do our best to, to find it or um, like I ordered, like I saw references to certain material in a book and then I would, I ordered it. I ordered the actual book or I ordered the article. At one point, Carol asked me to try to find an obituary or a death notice. And I finally found it in one of our original newspapers. So because I love the objects, um, I, I will do a little show and tell and see if I can hold up you can see that I'm, I'm actually in the, the archives workroom of the Western Maryland room. And there are a lot of original newspapers here. I'm working on a project right now to try to um, do some microfilming of some of our original newspapers. Anyway, this is one of the beautiful newspaper books that we have. And showing things did online is much easier, but... <laughs> This um, death notice that Carol asked me to find was in this newspaper, whoa. And what was interesting is that I was looking in the location that it would have been, and I was looking after the date of death, but I finally found it on the very day that, that she passed away, and it was on the front page. So there was a whole, a whole little article about her that just says, death of an aged lady. So sometimes it just takes so much work to figure out where something might be, but once you, if you find it, it's, it's very rewarding, of course. And um, one other primary source that I wanted to show you is our 1803-04 tax record book. We have an original. It has also been transcribed and it is online at our Western Maryland Historical Library website, which is called Wilbur. And the address is on our contact slide, which Carol will be showing you soon at the end of her presentation. But anyway, I love the actual article and I love taking care of it. And we were very hopeful because the time period was right that some of the names we were looking for would be in here. And there is one that is on the family tree, but it wasn't the exact one we were looking for. Anyway, items like this, of course, are, are exciting to use, and especially if, if you're able to find something that you're looking for. So now I'll turn it over to Carol, and she will give the presentation. Thank you, Elizabeth. And like Elizabeth said, we always like to verify whatever information we find. We don't just take the article's word for it. We need to look at the primary source. So let me share my screen with you. And so we were tasked with finding out information about Susanna Amos Yo and Benjamin Franklin Yo. Susanna and Benjamin Franklin Yo Sr., this attractive looking couple, married December 19, 1801 at the Methodist Church in Baltimore, Maryland. Susanna was 17 years old when she married Benjamin and he was 26 years old. He was working as a tailor in Baltimore. Their marriage produced four children. And uh, Elizabeth and I have been working on this actually since we were first asked to do this. So it's been several months we've been working on this. We meet almost every Friday um, to do research. And I was still finding new information this week. And what I did find was um, 
that they had another child that I had not known about um, until I looked at a uh, photocopy of a Bible page. So Susan Yo, their firstborn, died at the age of five months. And then they had Benjamin Franklin Jr., Mary Elizabeth, and Sarah Ann. Benjamin Jr. and Mary Elizabeth are the featured children in the portraits. And our research indicated, like Daniel said, that Joshua Johnson lived in close proximity to the Yo's. Susanna Amos was born in 1784. She was the daughter of Catherine and James Amos. Susanna passed away in 1809 at the very young age of 25. We were fortunate to find Susanna's date of birth. Benjamin kept vital records in a family Bible. And if you do any kind of genealogy, a family Bible is just a, a wonderful resource for your research because between the older Bibles, the great big, big ones had um, between the Old Testament and the New Testament, they had pages where families could keep vital information about marriage, birth, and death. And so uh, Benjamin had one of these Bibles and he did keep records in that. And we found a photocopy of the page from that Bible. Before birth certificates, finding a date of birth could be very challenging. Baltimore City, for example, started recording births in 1875, and the rest of Maryland kept records beginning in 1898. Most birth dates are collected from family Bibles or baptismal records. Also of note is that Benjamin, Benjamin was literate. We know that because of his entries in the family Bible. Being literate in the early 1800s was not something that could be assumed. And I noticed when Daniel was showing some of the documents, he had those manumission papers that many of the people signed with an X because they were not literate. So that was not something that you could naturally assume that everybody could read and write. By 1810, according to the US federal census, Benjamin moved his tailor business and family to Hagerstown, Maryland. He made his home on Prospect Street. Benjamin is also listed in the 1810 City Directory of Baltimore. However, that information would have been gathered in 1809. The data for city directories is always obtained at least a year before the book is published. We believe Susanna may have died in Baltimore. We could not find an obituary for Susanna, but did find a notation of her death in the family Bible. In 1811, Benjamin married Mary Helm of Williamsport, Maryland. Benjamin Yeo Sr. passed away in 1832 at the age of 57. He had the distinction of being one of the first citizens in Hagerstown to die of cholera. Not a good distinction, but he was one of three others that died of cholera. The local newspaper remembered him as a most esteemable, enterprising, and useful citizen. He was a kind husband, affectionate parent, and was respected for the urbanity of his manners, sincerity of his professions, and strict justice in all his transactions. His son, Benjamin Jr. earned a law degree from Jefferson College in Pennsylvania. He became a member of the Bar Association and in 1824 was appointed Justice of the Peace by the governor and council for Washington County. He went on to serve as a representative to the Maryland House of, Adele of Delegates between 1828 and 1830. He and his wife Narcissa had two children, Mary Post Yo and Benjamin Rush Yo. They spent most of their married life living in Baltimore. Mary Elizabeth Yo married George Fetching. George owned a clothing store in Hagerstown. And as you can see, he is uh, nicely decked out in his uh, suit there in that photo. 
His establishment was advertised frequently in the Hagerstown Torch and Light public advertiser in the Hagerstown Mail. George was quite involved in the community and the Methodist Church. At the annual meeting of the first Hagerstown Hose Company held at Town Hall in 1836, George was elected vice president. That fire company is still in existence with the same name. I usually refer to it as First Hose. It's located in the first block of South Potomac Street here in Hagerstown. In 1842, he was appointed to the Hagerstown Total Abstinence Society. On the 4th of July that year, George and his fellow committee members would be having speakers to mark the holiday instead of celebrating with libations. Mary and George had six children and they are buried at Rose Hill Cemetery, which is here in Hagerstown. Sarah Ann Yo, quite attractive young lady, is the youngest of Benjamin Yo Sr. and Susanna. She was married twice. Her first husband passed away seven years after they were married. In 1835, she married George Post. According to our research, research George was involved in many diff different endeavors. He is first listed as a teacher, then a clerk for the Washington County government. He advertised his bid to become sheriff, but drops out of the race before election day. George passes away at the age of 45. Sarah had no children. Toward the end of her life, she lives with her sister, Mary Elizabeth's daughter, Sally Freener. When tracing family history, it is always beneficial to have an unusual given name or surname. With the Yo family, that was the case. We mistakenly thought that Greenberry was going to be an unusual first name and was also going to fit into that category. It was not so. We found many Greenberry Wilsons in the area in which he lived. We found old Greenberry Wilsons, young Greenberry Wilsons, Caucasian Greenberry Wilsons, and African American Greenberry Wilsons. On another note, one of the cardinal rules in doing genealogy is spelling doesn't count. There are many reasons why people's names were spelled differently in records sometimes spelled differently in the same document. You may see Louisiana's name spelled several different ways. With few documents in the early 19th century, especially for women, determining the correct spelling of someone's name is a challenge, if not impossible. Louisiana's roots are from Washington County. She was in Orndorff, a surname that is still found in this area. Greenberry was from the Baltimore area and his occupation is flower merchant. His portrait was painted prior to him, him marrying Louisiana. How Louisiana and Greenberry met proved to be a challenge for Elizabeth and me, but more about that later. Louisiana was the fourth born to Susanna and Johan or John Orndorff. John's family was in the grain mill business. Louisiana's father, John, passed away when she was just a year old. Her mother died when she was three years, eight months. Louisiana and her siblings went to live with their mother's sister, Mary Wilgamot Schnebley. Mary was a noteworthy resident of Washington County. She lived to 103 years, nine months, and two days. At Zion Reformed Church, a stained glass window is dedicated to Mary and her husband, Colonel David Schnebley. If you can read the writing on the stained glass window that I have on the slide, you will see that Mary was credited as living one month longer than what we found. We wanted the stained glass window to be correct, especially me because Zion is my church and I see that window every Sunday. But after much research, we had to agree 
that she lived the age of 103 years, nine months, not 10, and two days. The connection between the Orndorffs and the Wilsons was not immediately apparent to us. Since the Orndorffs were in the grain business and Greenberry Wilson sold grain, we thought this was the obvious connection. It was, sort of, but not how we suspected. Louisiana's father, John, died when Louisiana was a baby. He was not part of the solution. John's oldest brother, Christopher, assumed the responsibility of his father's mill business early on. While he was still in his teens, he was in charge of the wagon trains hauling flour and tobacco from the mill and plantation to Baltimore. He was described as genial, genial with straightforward integrity, which made him successful in early business contacts. We thought, aha, we have found the connection. But again, we were incorrect. John's brothers continued the mill business after their father passed away, but sold it to Jacob, Jacob Mumal around 1805, and they moved to Kentucky. It seemed like our last clue just headed west. We finally got a breakthrough when Elizabeth found a notation in the book from Mill Wheel to Plowshare written by Julia Angeline Drake and James Ridgely Orndorff. John's youngest brother, Jacob, also part of the mill business, dies at age 33. He leaves a wife and four children. Jacob Orndorff's wife sold her share of the land to Jacob Mumal in 1813. She moves to Baltimore with her son, John H. Orndorff, another John Orndorff. This one's John H., the son. This is um, the other John Orndorff's nephew. John H. Orndorff in 1822, at the age of 27 years, establishes the, the firm of Orndorff and Wilson Merchants. This scenario makes the most sense as to how Louisiana and Greenberry met. Back to Louisiana's father. In genealogy, it can be rare that we get to glance at the personality of a person we are researching. We talk about that as um, the term is putting flesh on the bones. Regarding Louisiana's father, it was written among those who did not set out with the family group was Christopher's brother, John, a sort of Rip Van Winkle whose chief accomplishments were hunting and playing the flute. In 1803, John sold the land he had inherited from his father to Peter Palmore. A, fix, a fictitious story that has survived said that John sold his plantation on the Potomac that he inherited from his father and started to the West with a bag of gold. Intrigued by big game, he is said to have set the bag of gold in a fence corner and then to have forgotten it. I'll um, ill adapt to the hard life of the pioneer. He died in 1807. John G. Orndorff, another a descendant of the first John Orndorff, told this fictitious story at the first Orndorff reunion held in 1886. The, um, the story about John being a Rip Van Winkle whose chief accomplishments were hunting and playing the flute gave uh, Elizabeth a, and I a smile on our face when we were up to our ears with sources but um, and books and newspapers, but we weren't finding anything. So it was great to finally find something that made us um, smile. Greenberry Barker Wilson and Louisiana Orndorff exchanged their wedding bells the same year that John H. Orndorff, this is Louisiana's first cousin, and Greenberry dissolved their business partnership. The couple was married May 23, 1826 at St. Paul's 
Reformed Church in Clear Spring, Maryland. The Reverend Isaac Keller performed the nuptials. We found that Reverend Keller's wife is the former Margaret Schnebley. And we searched without finding anything concrete that we thought she possibly was related to Colonel David Schnebley, who raised uh, Louisiana and her siblings. Greenberry and Louisiana had two children, Mary Wilson and Augustus Schnebley Wilson. Mary, daughter of Louisiana and Greenberry, married Luke Bryan. They started their married life in Washington County, but his different occupations and military connections took him to Virginia, North Carolina, New York City, Illinois, and finally to Frederick County, Maryland. Following his time as a volunteer for General Jeb Stewart, he resigned his com commission, perhaps for health reasons. Next, he was an overseer of a plantation in North Carolina. Some other occupations include a commission merchant, general manager of the Illinois Central Railroad, and then finally, he purchases farmland and a mansion near Urbana, Maryland. Augustus Schnebley Wilson, the second child of Louisiana and Greenberry, was born in 1842. There was a 13 year age difference between Augusta and his sister Mary. Before birth control, there were several reasons for such a large age difference. Typically children were born every two years in families. But some of the reasons for such a large age difference were the husband was at war, there was a stillbirth, a miscarriage, epidemic or infant mortality. Augustus married Margaret Barnum. They had two children, Margaret and Annie. Margaret, his wife, died at the age of 33. Augustus never remarried. His obituary stated his father, Greenberry, was owner of the Bear Hill Copper Mines at Mount Washington, Baltimore, which was new information to Elizabeth and me. From our research, it appears he may have been a stockholder but did not own the mine. The Schnebley name Augustus was given is also quite familiar uh, name in Washington County and also to Zion Reform Church. Our former city councilman for Washington, for Hagerstown and county commissioner for Washington County is John Snebley, who is also a member of Zion Reform Church. Is John and his sister Judy related to Colonel David Schnebley? I asked. They weren't certain if or how they might be related, but that will be a project for another day. I wanted to finish up with some genealogy guidelines. I can work genealogy into almost any topic. And luckily someone asked me to do that tonight. So when you work on your genealogy, you always start with yourself and you work backward so that you can have a solid foundation. It's very rare for you to pick a person in the, born in the 1800s and start there and try to work forward. It's very difficult because you're never quite sure if you have the right person. You also want to verify your information. You wanna make sure that not only do you find that information in one place, but you find it in several other places so that it, you know that the person providing the information did not get it incorrectly. You also never want to copy someone else's research. You, you can use their information as a clue, but again, you need to verify what they have done. Look at their sources, look at the sources with your own eyes and make sure they're correct. Like I said before, spelling doesn't count. Another tip is analyze your information. Does it make sense? I was looking for the parent of my great grandfather. I finally found a clue. Unfortunately, it said that my great grandfather's father was born 10 years after my great grandfather was born. So obviously that 
did not make sense. So you have to analyze it, just don't accept it. Make sure it's correct. And the thing that provides a framework for your research would be census records and city directories. Census records started in 1790. They're done every 10 years. And um, so you can find what they're doing, where they're living, who's living in the household. But the city directories are done every two years and they are still creating city directories. And so they can fill in that time frame between census records. There's a great deal of information on the internet, but you still need to go to the library, uh, talk to Elizabeth, come to the historical society, um, go to cemeteries, go to churches to find information. So I will finish with our contact information. If you have any interest in getting started with genealogy, I teach genealogy through Hagerstown Community College, but I also will answer questions if you give me a call or email me and help you get started. And then Elizabeth's information is there as well. Um, and she, the Finding Your Heritage in Western Maryland's Historical Library is through Washington County Public Library. And then Kinship is the dedicated genealogy center at the Washington County Historical Society. And we have a genealogy researcher that is there every Wednesday afternoon to answer questions. Um, Elizabeth, do you want to add anything? Maybe nothing except that the Washington County Genealogical Society meets once a month and anyone is welcome to join that. And Carol is in charge of that meeting and we have a wonderful time making connections. <laughs> the second Tuesday of the month from seven to 8.30, except in December because I take a genealogy research trip to Salt Lake City every year. Okay, thank you, Brett. I guess you're next. Thank you, Karen. I'm just going to share my screen really quickly. So I'm going to be relatively quick. Um, but before I begin, hi, everyone. As mentioned before, my name is Brett Peters, and I am the curator of the Washington County Historical Society. Uh, before I begin my talk, I'd like to thank both Sarah, Daniel, and the uh, and the museum for having me. Uh, this is gonna. This has been a lot of fun so far, and uh, it's gonna be a lot more fun still, uh, because I get to talk about one of the most interesting objects in our collection. So before I get to that, I'm gonna give you a little bit of an outline as to what we're gonna be talking about tonight. First, to put my presentation in context, I'm gonna give you some. Uh, preliminary information about Joshua Johnson that'll be pretty relevant to uh, the painting itself. Uh, second, I'm going to talk about a remarkable painting, as mentioned, in our collection. Uh, this painting is of Dr. Edward L. Butler, uh, and it was done by Joshua Johnson. Next, I'll talk about the genealogy of the Butler family. Uh, unlike Carol and Elizabeth, I am not as well versed with genealogy. Uh, I did make a cardinal error. I actually did start in the 1800s and I did make my way forward. We uh, it. it did somehow work out, which is fortuitous, uh, but I'll outline that for you a little bit later on. Uh, finally, I'm gonna describe the process that we went through internally and externally uh, to get the painting of Dr. Edward L. Butler both appraised and authenticated as a, as a legitimate Joshua Johnson piece. So Daniel already talked a little bit about Joshua Johnson. I'm gonna do it again because I believe that in order to really uh, understand this painting, that's pretty vitally important. So as Daniel mentioned, Joshua Johnson was born in or, in or around 1763. Uh, Joshua Johnson or Johnston, as I've seen he's called sometimes, is the earliest documented professional African-American painter. Uh, he's thought to be the son of an enslaved woman and a white man. Uh, he's thought to have obtained his freedom in or around 1782. Uh, following an apprenticeship as a blacksmith, uh, Johnson taught himself to paint and was noted in the Baltimore City directories as a portrait painter, where he was active 
uh, between 1796 and 1824. Now remember that, that's gonna be pretty important later on. Johnson is thought to have died between 1824 and 1830. So Johnson was based primarily out of Baltimore. Uh, what's really interesting to me, and uh, you can see here in this quote, uh, he advertised himself as a self-taught genius. So he certainly didn't appear to, to lack for bravado or confidence. Uh, Johnson painted many portraits in between 1796 and 1824. Most of these depict affluent residents of Baltimore. And today these paintings are incredibly rare. Uh, they are included in collections like the National Gallery of Art, the, Met the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the Smithsonian, the Smithsonian Museum of, art, of American Art, the Brooklyn Museum, and the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts. Oh, and uh, of course, the Washington County Historical Society. So despite there being relatively few works done by Joshua Johnson, the Washington County Historical Society is actually in possession of one. Uh, the portrait itself, which you can see here, and I do apologize for the angle of the painting, uh, the angle of the picture taken. I tried to get up nice and close, but uh, we actually had a secretary in front of it. Uh, so the portrait, as I mentioned, depicts Edward, Dr. Edward L. Butler. The painting is attributed to the year 1820, uh, near the end of uh, Joshua Johnson's artistic career. Uh, here's a description of the portrait. Uh, the portrait is a study of Dr. Edward L. Butler. Butler himself is wearing a high-necked collar, a cravat with a diamond and ruby stick pin, a dark frock coat, and his hair is combed back on, on the top and the sides, as was the fashion with the, of the time, with slight sideburns. He's sitting in a red upholstered chair and resting his left arm on two books while holding another. And his eyes are a light color. Uh, when you get up close, they actually look to be gray. Uh, looking from it here, they actually look to be more of a blue color. So Dr. Edward L. Boltler, a little bit about him. Uh, Boltler or Botler. Uh, he was born in Washington County, Maryland on December 3rd, 1796. When he came of age, he attended the University of Maryland School of Medicine in Baltimore, Maryland. He was likely based out of Baltimore from around the late 18 teens uh, until September 1st, 1832, when he married Prudence Cheney and moved to the Sandy Hook Keep Trist area of Washington County. Uh, in the year 1820, Boltler was actually at the Maryland School of Medicine. Uh, so he likely sat for this portrait while still in school. Uh, so the painting itself was actually acquired in 2002 from the estate of Landon Bacchus, the great grandson of Edward L. Butler. So I'm going to get into this a little bit, but I'm not going to I'm not going to delve too far in. But I will say that the Butler family has relatively deep roots, both in Maryland and in Washington County, Maryland. Uh, so before I get into their genealogy, I'd be remiss if I didn't note that much of this information about the Butler family was unearthed in the Kinship Genealogical Library at the Washington County Historical Society. A lot of this was confirmed through census records and through uh, you know, multiple sources that corroborated each other. Uh, we have a pretty extensive file on the Butler family. So if you wanna check that out, do come by. As I mentioned, Dr. Edward L. Butler was born in Washington County in 1796. He was born to Thomas and Jane Giddings. His father, Thomas Butler, was born in Frederick County, Maryland in 1768 to, Ed, to Henry Butler and Sarah Ellen Elsby. Uh, Henry's father, also named Henry, was born in 1706 in, uh, 1706 in Prince George's County, Maryland. He died in 1760 in Frederick County, Maryland. And of course, that could be part of Washington County today. Uh, Washington County was formed out of part of Frederick County uh, in 1776. Uh, so he, he died in 1760. His, uh, Henry's mother, uh, Sarah, uh, Sarah Magruder, was born in 1710 in Prince George's County, Maryland. Uh, this Henry's father was born in 1683 in Calvert County, Maryland. Uh, 
Henry's grandfather, Charles, was born before 1645 in England. So that's the extent of the Boulder family in America. It goes all the way back to the 1600s, which I thought was incredibly, incredibly cool. Uh, another really interesting thing about Edward L. Boulder. Uh, so his father was Thomas, his mother was Jane. His father actually remarried in 1801. Uh, it appears that Jane had died uh, shortly after uh, Edward's birth in 1796. So Thomas remarried and actually had four other children. Uh, the descendant of one of these children was actually Landing, Langdon Bacchus, who, as I mentioned before, was the donor of this portrait, but also the, grand, the great grandson of Dr. Bogler. So I've traced that back and he is indeed the great grandson of, of Bogler. Uh, and we can actually trace that back pretty easily. Langdon's mother was actually Ellen R. Boatler Bacchus, and she was the daughter of Robert H. E. Boatler and Rebecca Cheney Hammond Boatler. Uh, Robert was the son of Edward L. Boatler and Prudence, uh, Prudence, uh, sorry, Prudence Cheney. So that's it for the genealogy. Uh, if you want to learn more, uh, you can contact me. My information is at the end of this presentation, but you can also come to the Washington County Historical Society. So, as I mentioned before, Joshua Johnson was active in Baltimore in between 1796 and 1824. I did mention that that would come into play uh, relatively later on, and here it is. So, more than 80 works have been attributed to Joshua Johnson. None of, Johnson, none of Johnson's portraits are dated, and only one of them apparently bears his signature. So how then did we at the Washington County Historical Society attribute this painting on the right of Edward L. Boatler to Joshua Johnson? This was actually a really interesting process, and it involved a lot of investigation. So the first part of this investigation was actually uh, into the donor's provenance, which means the history of the object, the history of the donor. So the first thing we did was look to see if uh, Langdon Bacchus was who he claimed to be. It turns out that was correct. That was the first step. Uh, another thing that we realized early on uh, was the style. So after some research, we, we knew that Joshua Johnson had a very particular style. Uh, a lot of his paintings are painted in a pretty stiff manner. Uh, the faces of the sitters uh, and their gazes are typically straightforward. The backgrounds are usually plain, and uh, there's typically some stock objects such as uh, you know letters, books, a chair, uh, and there's also uh, some other tells such as an angular nose and almond-shaped eyes and the hands, which I'll go into later as well. So after doing a, a preliminary kind of uh, check for all of these, uh, the next step was actually to call in Daniel, uh, the curator at over at the Museum of the Fine Arts. Uh, so he came in and we were both actually at this point more or less skeptical as to whether or not this was a Joshua Johnson piece. I mean, what were the odds? So the first thing he did was run a black light over it uh, to kind of investigate to see if it was you know, redone at any points or conserved. Uh, after a few minutes, he kind of, we hung the painting back up and we, you know, he kind of investigated it for those same features that I mentioned, the angular nose, the almond shaped eyes, that kind of the stiff features, the hands, he spent a lot of time on the hands, uh, and the books, and the, uh, what was it called, my apologies, the little pen on his, uh, that where his uh, tie would have been. Apparently that pin is actually, can actually be found in another painting done by Joshua Johnson. So that right away was kind of a dead tell. So as I mentioned before, one of the things that we were really looking for were the eyes. Uh, were they an almond shape? And as you can see from this kind of uh, zoomed in portion of the photograph or of the painting, the eyes are an are, uh, almond shaped and the nose has that characteristic angular look. The hands were another dead giveaway. The hands were very, very similar to a lot of Johnson's other paintings. Uh, in my mind, the hands are, are more or less rudimentarily done. And uh, they're really, really interesting. But Daniel, from that, he said, you know, this is, this is really interesting. 
this kind of looks to be what we're looking for. And then of course the books, the books were also a kind of a tell as well. Now again, the uh, brooch or the uh, tie pin, that was, uh, that was a dead giveaway right then and there. Uh, that made Daniel kind of go back and say, you know, hmm. Uh, because that, again, that, that appears to be on another of his paintings. So before I get there, so after that, uh, Daniel on the spot, neither of us felt comfortable saying, you know, this is a Joshua Johnson piece. Uh, so he sent it to some, he sent some images to, to an expert and uh, the expert, you know, got back to us a few days later and said, you know, that's, that's most definitely or most probably a Joshua Johnson piece. So that was, uh, that was a tumultuous few days. It was really, really fascinating. And it just goes to show you uh, what you, what you might originally see as an ordinary work. Uh, all of a sudden, when you're looking at it from a completely di different perspective, it turns into something magical and almost otherworldly. So this painting, in my mind, took on you know a whole new, uh, a whole new way of being. It was previously in a storage room at the Washington County Historical Society and not on display. Uh, after we found out its provenance, we immediately put it on display in one of our parlors uh, as befitting a Joshua Johnson piece. Uh, so if you do want to see it today, you can come by the Washington County Historical Society. We are now open to the public by appointment only. And uh, when you come, you can give a good look at it. It's actually a really, really fantastic piece. And uh, so that's what I have for you today. If you have any questions, you can email me or uh, give us a call at the Washington County Historical Society or shoot us an email uh, over at our uh, website. These are some of the sources I used uh, in addition to uh, corroborating this evidence in the uh, Washington County Historical Society's Kinship Library. So that's what I have. Thank you, everyone. I'm sure Daniel will be back with us in a moment, but if anybody has any particular questions, do feel free to put them in the chat or Q&A. We can also unmute folks if they raise their hands. Um, this was a lot of fun for me. I've spent not as much time as Daniel, but I've spent a considerable amount of time with these paintings and it's great to feel like I know them a little bit better. Um, and. I was really, I'll just say something uh, a little bit of minutia, but now I'm look that I look at um, Dr. Boatler again, that like really hot, like acetic yellow is very much like Greenberry Wilson's yellow as well. These like um, sort of bits of decoration almost that Johnson adds to his paintings, the, the tie pins and the, the little bits of color that are almost surprising. Um, I definitely see that. Um, I have some things. One of the things I wanted to ask about is, uh, and I thought of this, you know, we all got together and had a pre-meeting. Um, I think it would have been nice for our uh, panelists if they knew what kind of questions they were getting to prepare. Um, but I just thought of this while they were talking, which is sort of what is the impact of digital resources, both for the researcher and I also think for preservation, right? You often hear about people working with paper records and oh dear, there was a flood there was a fire, all of those, um, you know, documents are gone. Um, but are, do we feel comfortable with electronic records? I, I mean, Elizabeth, this is like, this is completely your, your work life, right? About uh, electronic access and going paperless and all of that. And I just would love to hear some of your insights about that. So I'm sure it, it it varies according to you know who feels more comfortable or not. Um, I think the digital world is a is a wonderful resource because, as you say, the preservation is you know taken care of. You don't have to worry about housing the actual item in a in a good um, environment. I mean, we do worry about like our 180304 tax book. And in the past, I've had all of the pages interleaved so that, you know, the acid from the pages is separated and doesn't, you know, they don't harm each other. 
Um, but it was a wonderful thing. I actually was the person that transcribed the book some years ago. And then when Jill, the head of our Wilbur um, Western Maryland historical website, um, put it on, on Wilbur, it was, that, that's great because, you know, we don't want um, researchers handling this all the time. It's usually kept safe in a box on the, sh on the shelf. And we actually have a, a paper copy of it as well, so that if someone comes in and you know wants to access it that way, because I I find that there are things in in the actual object that give you more information sometimes than what's online, you know going to visit the paintings at your at your Joshua Johnson exhibit you you can learn a lot by viewing the actual object that, that sometimes is not as apparent in online. So, hmm. so are you are you confident that our digital records will main will remain accessible? And you know, I, we're always you know upgrading to the next thing. And I know that's something we talk about in museums, even about you know time based art. Like, how do we ensure that we're going to be able to continue to show videos and and right, things? Right. So it. Yeah, I, I, I'm not totally confident. I always <laughs> worry about that. Does anyone else want to speak to that question, Fred or Carol? Carol Carol's amazing with online resources in, in the genealogy world, especially, you know, she would get, when I was working with her and she would get on Ancestry, I was just amazed at all the things she could, you know, find. And do you ever worry about <laughs> those kinds of resources vanishing? There, there are genealogists that want to go totally digital. They, they want to get rid of all of their papers. They don't, you know, they don't want to have any of that. I like both. I, I like researching online, but I print off copies and create notebooks of my family, the families that I'm, you know, units that I'm researching. And I like flipping through those. So you know, for me, it's both. And then those, the documents you're talking about, I have things like my mother's birth certificate and original death certificates for family members. And we actually keep those in uh, archival quality sleeves and keep those safe. And they're not on the bookshelf. They're somewhere safe in our house. There is something about the power of objects. We did have a terrific question come in in the Q&A, which is how do African-Americans tackle their heritage given that it wasn't until 1870 that the census included African-Americans by name? It's a big question, I know. It is. It is, um, it is very difficult and it really depends on where the person was born. If they were born in Virginia, there was a lot of damage done by one particular person who, who uh, had this one drop rule that if you had one drop of blood from any other, if you weren't completely Caucasian, if you were African American or Native American, then you were lumped together and those records were changed and um, it makes it almost impossible. Um, that is a, a skill in itself. Um, I have several genealogy colleagues who have researched and have studied that. And there are people out there that can, can help with that. But yes, it is, it is a problem. A lot of times the slave schedules will only list the name of the slave owner and how many slaves they own and not name the people that that they own. They may list a first name. It, it really varies from place to place. In Maryland, we find a little bit of both. We find uh, slave owners who kept good records and then other slave owners who did not. So it's not an easy question to answer. I, I find, um, and in terms of Joshua Johnson, you know, the backstory is we do not know much about his mother at all, except that she was enslaved. Um, and we, we make assumptions, which is, of course, dangerous. So we know his dad 
um, you know, was not wealthy, was a laborer. And Daniel, you can interrupt me if I get anything wrong, since this is more your content than mine. But his dad buys him as I think like a two or three year old, like a toddler. And so, you know, he's still enslaved, although I suspect his father's not using him for labor. His father is raising him as his son and eventually frees him. But the essay in our catalog about his biography, what I found so provocative about it is the questions we can't answer. Um, the fact that um, there is a point when um, maybe the slave trade isn't as dominant, when race relations are different and this intermarriage is more common. Um, you know, there's just, there's just so many things, questions we can't answer, which are kind of heartbreaking. Um, you know, in a way. Um, and, and I'm not really saying much other than connecting it to Joshua Johnson and the fact that it, there's still so much about his background that's a mystery. And thank goodness um, those manumission pa papers were rescued so that we have that bit of concrete evidence. Um, and there are people who, in the field who are convinced there will be more discoveries. So I'm, I'm, I'm really hoping with them that we do make more discoveries about his background, his training, you know, perhaps uh, his, his family itself. For, for any of the audience that um, may be trying to do some uh, research on African-Americans that may have lived in this county, the Washington County Historical Society has quite a collection of manumission papers. Yes. Really moving. When I am in the galleries, um, which I try to do multiple times a day, I walk through. Um, you can talk to the security guards. They know when, I, when I'm between tasks, I go walk around and see what's going on in the museum. But if people are in the Joshua Johnson show, I almost grab them. I'm conscious of COVID, but I steer them over to those papers and talk about how they really give me goosebumps because they are this concrete um, you know, trace of his life that goes along with his paintings and helps us understand him so much better. Um, I guess this is why we're all in the jobs we're in because these things do give us goosebumps and yeah. and um, and keep us motivated as we go on. Um, Daniel, do you have any questions or anything? I had a couple things I was gonna read because I happened to be reading this article about genealogical research. And I thought, um, I, th I think most of this stuff was touched on, but I thought it was well said in here, but I'll give you an opportunity to jump in if you want to, Daniel, first. Sure, thanks, Sarah. Um, one thing that I wanted to do was to just show you who Brett was talking before, just to, to clarify for you about the tie pin and some of those particular That's features. Great. Yeah, um, no, I, it's fun to walk through the show and look at the tie pins and, and look at the fingers inserted in the books. Um, see all of those commonalities. If you look here, our Greenberry Wilson on the right and our Dr. Yellow? Butler, we zoom in. And when Brett and I were looking at the painting, I said, I, I looked to Brett and I said, that tie pin looks awfully familiar. Where did I see it? Well, it's on view in the gallery from the Maryland Center for History and Culture's painting. And you can see that it's not identical, but it is so similar. And the use, as Sarah said before, of the yellow. In this case, Johnson has used it on this chair that he's got here, but he also applies it to the uh, ends of the pages here, or the books that Dr. Butler has his hand on. And because of the pose and the way that the fingers are rendered, they're very similar to Dr. Butler. You're looking at the same time period there, circa 1820, for both paintings. So I just wanted to put that in there so that people can see Joshua Johnson's technique, particularly in his later years. Yeah, yeah. yeah they're, they're very fun to see these things uh, next to each other. So um, this is actually a article I was reading um, by the writer Julie Clam about researching her family background. And um, most of this was touched on by uh, Carol when she was talking about her process, but it's really well said here. As soon as you start even a cursory exploration into your family's past, you see the inconsistencies. Names, dates, and places change throughout the records. In one place, it might say a person was born in London, and in another, it says Liverpool. My point is that genealogical records are neither a straight line nor consistent, like a lot of life 
it's open to interpretation. Um, for example, not a single one of the US census records I found in my investigation of the Morris sisters spelled their names correctly. Some of the records didn't list them at all. Each sister had about five different dates of birth. People of their time may have taken down the information correctly, but I couldn't be certain that the librarian who read the information from the handwritten documents typed them correctly into databases. So that's also another thing about digitization. I mean, I love, um, in my prior job, I had a lot of things transcribed by interns because it's so wonderful to be able to search by word um, and look for things, particularly if you're doing searching about artworks and you can search by artist's name or painting title or date. Um, but there's no guarantee that the person who's doing that work is, is doing it perfectly. So it is, um, you know, this, this thing of having to not just find information once, but having to find it um, multiple times in order to confirm is, is um, makes it, uh, you need to be tenacious. <laughs> and, and for many people, um, you know, they had 12, 13, 14 kids. They may have been illiterate. They couldn't get the information down anyway. They, the name was spelled by the census taker the way the census taker thought it was to be spelled, and they couldn't correct them because they couldn't read it. Um, and also, I found that in certain uh, areas and certain cultures, it wasn't important to know when your birthday was. In Ireland, for example, uh, when they started to have what we have were like a social security kind of a system over there, people didn't know their birthday. So if you could remember a certain major weather event that happened, then you were old enough to receive this benefit. So, you know, I, I've learned a lot about. True. And, and spelling clearly, you know, it's not just that people, it's not, you can't necessarily people say people spelled things wrong. I don't think there was this care about spelling consistently right. for a while. Um, even artists, you often see them spelling their names differently in different situations. Anyway, um, I think, um, you know, I, I have I could ask things all night and keep the conversation going, but um, we've kept everybody here over an hour. I so enjoyed this. I loved all the different case studies and examples we gave. Um, somebody's wondering if we're going to collaborate again in the future. Um, I, I, I rarely say no to people. <laughs> so Brad, if there's anything we can help you with, we'll help. Um, I'm so happy that your uh, Dr. Boatler ended up getting the blessing of the uh, Joshua Johnson scholars. That's an exciting thing for you and for Hagerstown. And, um, you know, we're, we're always pulling other people in to help us do our work better. So I hope we can come up with more projects. So folks, let us know if you think of good projects we can work on together. And I will just give a quick um, conclusion here. I wanted to remind everybody, and I have it written on a piece of paper that I'm going to have to pull up on my screen, but I want to remind everybody of when our next Let's Talk Art is, which is um, September 23rd. Daniel and I will be back online. Um, we're going to do a, a fast and furious uh, <laughs> hour. We're going to talk about highlights of the museum's collection because September 16th is actually the museum's 90th birthday. And so we're going to focus on the breadth and depth and richness and some surprises in uh, the Washington County Museum of Fine Arts collection, which I still, I just had my one year anniversary recently, but I am still really scratching the surface in getting to know it. And I loved this program tonight because it got me, uh, let me get to know my colleagues, um, Carolyn, Brett and Elizabeth a little bit better. So I thank everybody for being with us tonight. Um, maybe you can start your weekend off early. It's Thursday night. Um, we'll see you again next month for Let's Talk Art.